hydraulic systems can be very simple, like this one. Or they can be quite complicated, containing several circuits and hundreds of components. Now there's no doubt that the bigger a system is, the more things there are to go wrong with it. But if you understand the reasons why hydraulic systems fail, and if you take a good logical approach to troubleshooting them, you'll be able to work on any hydraulic system and keep it running smoothly. Hello, I'm Dave Brown for Teletrain. Today we begin our course on troubleshooting and maintaining hydraulic systems. Keeping a system running smoothly is not difficult. As you'll see, it takes some care and it takes some thought, but it is something you can learn to do. Now there are three important aspects to troubleshooting a hydraulic system. First, when a system breaks down, you've got to isolate the fault, repair the trouble, and get the system up and running again as quickly as possible. And we're going to show you how to do it. But that's only part of the job. You should also be able to recognize when a breakdown is a symptom of a larger problem, like heat or contamination, or even a problem with the design of the system. And then get to the root of the trouble and try to make sure that the breakdown does not happen again. And last, a good hydraulics mechanic is a person who anticipates problems by routinely inspecting the system to watch for conditions which could lead to trouble. And by making sure that scheduled preventive maintenance is performed on the system. In other words, this course is not designed to turn you into just a good parts changer. What we're going to do is help you become a top-notch hydraulics mechanic. Here in lesson one, we'll use this simple hydraulic system to demonstrate the logical way to troubleshoot hydraulic problems quickly. In lessons two and three, we'll look at the root causes of many hydraulic failures. Heat, leakage, and contamination, and see how to keep them to a minimum. Then in lesson four, we'll examine the symptoms and causes of failures in particular components. And last, in lesson five, we'll practice good troubleshooting technique on some common hydraulic circuits. When you finish viewing a program, read the appropriate material in your study guide and do the practice exercises which are included. Then when you feel you understand the material covered in the lesson, answer the review questions at the end of the chapter. All right, to begin with, troubleshooting is not a guessing game. And the people who take a hit or miss approach and just start swapping out components until they hit the right one are wasting a lot of time. When you've got to solve a problem, effective troubleshooting is based on a logical and systematic way of thinking. It requires an understanding of hydraulic principles. And it begins with using your powers of observation carefully to analyze the situation. In order to demonstrate troubleshooting procedures clearly, we've constructed a very basic hydraulic circuit. If you understand how to locate a problem in this system and get it up and running again quickly, you're on your way to troubleshooting any system effectively. Now it may seem obvious, but whenever you're troubleshooting a problem, it is important to remember the fundamental principle of hydraulics. If a part in the system is supposed to move under hydraulic power, whether it is the piston in our cylinder here, or a spool in a pilot operated valve, the fluid in the system must flow to that part under adequate pressure. Without flow and without the required pressure, the part is not going to move. It's as simple as that. At the bare minimum, in our system, here's what it takes to get the flow and pressure necessary to perform work safely. A motor or prime mover to turn the pump. A reservoir or tank to hold the fluid. And the pump, which generates flow of fluid out into the system. 
we are using a solenoid-operated four-way directional control valve to direct the flow of fluid to the A port of the cylinder to extend the rod or to the B port to retract the rod. To monitor system pressure, we've installed a pressure gauge on the pump output. And to protect the system from excessive pressure buildup, we've placed a pressure relief valve here. And last, to cut down on wear and tear in the system, we've installed filtration devices here and here to control the level of contamination in the fluid. Now, if the piston should fail to move, it will be because, for one reason or another, that cylinder is not getting flow at the proper pressure. So if the cylinder will not respond when the directional control valve is actuated, the problem is to find out exactly why the fluid is not flowing properly into the cylinder. These are the steps to follow when you are troubleshooting a system malfunction. And we'll be coming back to them often in this course. The first three deal with gathering information. As we'll see later on, the machine operator can often provide some good clues about a problem and knowing exactly how the parts of a system work together, as well as the maintenance and repair history of the machine, are both important tools for tracking down a problem quickly. But here we're going to concentrate on step three, inspecting our machine to look for obvious causes of the failure. And we are going to see how much we can find out about the problem quickly, using just our eyes, our ears, and our sense of touch. The most obvious fault is going to be an external leak somewhere in the system. Normally, even if the fluid is hiding under a machine, the operator is probably going to know it's there and tell you about it. But if lines have been run under the floor, a leak can avoid notice. If there is no evidence of a leak, we must systematically search for other possible causes. We can start at either the pump and reservoir or at the cylinder. In an on-the-job situation, we would begin at whichever place was the easiest to reach. But we would always proceed logically, inspecting the machine for obvious defects that might prevent fluid from flowing into the cylinder. All right, what might be wrong at the cylinder, which we can detect easily? One possibility is a mechanical failure. A system might be perfectly capable of providing the correct flow to the cylinder, but if the load is jammed, the normal force generated by the cylinder may not move it at all. Or if a cylinder body has been hit hard and is restraining the piston like this, fluid flow is also going to be impossible. So check the cylinder body for obvious signs of damage. A similar thing can happen if the rod has been bent or if the cylinder and load have become misaligned. The result is side loading. When side loading is severe enough and the piston is trying to stroke at an angle to the barrel instead of moving parallel to the walls, it can bind inside the cylinder. Even a small amount of side loading should be avoided because it wears out the cylinder packing and creates leakage. Now let's see what can be checked just as quickly at the pump and reservoir. First, is the pump running? If the shaft is visible, you can check to see if it is rotating. The problem could be as simple as a loose coupling. If the plant is not too noisy, you can listen for the pump's normal operating sound. You can put your hand on the housing to feel for vibration. Or you can check the pressure gauge. If you've got no pressure, you've probably got no flow because the pump is not turning at all. Now, if any of these procedures indicate that the pump is not running, you can be pretty sure there's a problem in the motor or in the coupling between the motor and the pump. And you better check them out carefully. If the pump is running, then how does it sound? 
An unusually loud noise could indicate that the pump is either cavitating because it is not getting an adequate supply of fluid or that it is drawing air in on the suction side. In either case, shut the pump down immediately and look for the source of the trouble on the suction side. First, examine the fluid level on the reservoir sight gauge, or if necessary, by actually checking the level in the tank. Then inspect the suction line for any obvious breaks or for loose fittings, which might be allowing air to enter the pump. As we'll see in lesson four, an inadequate supply of fluid or air getting into the suction line could spell death for a pump. If the fluid supply appears good and the reading on the pressure gauge is normal and you have discovered no unusual noise, you can assume that the pump is operating correctly. But suppose you find that the system pressure is abnormally low. This indicates that there is a leak or a break somewhere in the system or that a passage is open to the tank. Somehow, fluid is escaping from the pressure side of the circuit. Remember another basic hydraulic principle. Pressure results from the resistance to pump flow. In other words, you can think of the pressure side of the system as a kind of closed container pushing back against fluid flow. If there is an opening in that container which lets fluid escape, the pressure is going to be reduced. Now, if it is not an external leak dumping fluid on the floor, it could be an internal leak inside the pump. If the seals, veins, or some other part of the mechanism has worn out or been damaged, the fluid could be slipping back from the pressure side to the suction side. This will ordinarily show up as a hotter than normal pump housing. In a situation like ours, with no actuator movement at all, the pump would be extremely hot. The problem might also be with the system pressure relief valve. If the spring has weakened in the valve or a piece of contamination has lodged in the seat, the valve could be dumping the fluid back to tank at low pressure. And from the standpoint of our cylinder and the force required to move its load, that's just like opening up a line in the circuit. Very often, you can hear when a relief is bypassing fluid. If not, you can often feel with your hand for the vibration of the fluid moving through the bypass line. Or you can feel if the valve body has heated up. And be careful. Fluid dumping through the valve can easily make it hot enough to burn you. If the valve is bypassing at low pressure, see if you can reset it. The problem may be simply that someone has changed the valve setting. It happens all the time. Now, before we go on to examine the directional control valve, let's review what we've done. Based upon our knowledge of a few hydraulic principles, we inspected our machine for the obvious probable causes of a failure, the ones that could be detected quickly and easily. And notice that as we proceeded, we were systematically eliminating possibilities. First, we tried to eliminate the cylinder as the source of the problem. And to do that, we separated possible mechanical problems from problems with the flow of fluid to or from the cylinder. And we eliminated them one at a time. Then we followed the same procedure with the fluid source for the system. First, to check for flow problems, we eliminated the motor and coupling by making sure that the pump was running. Then we made sure that the fluid level was correct and that there were no leaks in the suction line or at the pump shaft seal. In the situation where we discovered a low system pressure, we tried to eliminate either slippage in the pump or a malfunctioning system relief valve. Now, when you see this process drawn out on paper, it looks a lot more complicated than it really is. All we did was eliminate possibilities in a logical order, trying to take care of the easiest possibilities first. 
And that's what good troubleshooting procedure is when you're trying to locate a fault. The elimination of possibilities in a logical order until you're left with the source of the trouble. Here is how the isolation procedure applies to inspecting our directional control valve quickly. If the valve is not shifting properly and allowing the fluid to flow to and from the cylinder ports, the piston will not move. So let's determine whether or not the valve is shifting, and if it is not, whether we can eliminate either the valve actuator or the valve itself as the source of the problem. We'd follow the same basic procedure no matter how the valve was actuated. On a manually actuated valve, we would begin by checking the linkage, trying to see or feel whether the lever has become separated from the spool in some way or excessive free play has developed. On a solenoid actuated valve like ours, we would first make certain that everyone was safely out of the way of anything in the system that might move, and then we would operate the valve. If the valve is operating properly, we should hear the solenoids click as they pull in, and we could probably see or feel some small movement in the lines on the A and B actuator ports as pressure is applied or removed from them. If we actuate the valve and do not hear the solenoids operating, even though the indicator lights may be functioning, we can be pretty sure that the problem is in the solenoids or the electrical circuitry supplying their power. Now suppose we do hear the solenoids clicking. Well, we've eliminated the solenoids as the probable cause of our malfunction. But now we've got to make certain that the spool is actually moving in the valve and shifting all the way. And to do that, we will try to actuate the cylinder using the manual override on the valve. If we cannot get the manual override to operate, we can assume that the solenoid mechanism is all right but that the trouble with the system is probably that the spool is binding in the valve body. In most situations, the thing to do would be to replace the valve with one that is working. But if the manual override does operate the cylinder, we have eliminated the valve as the probable cause of the failure. We can be pretty sure that the problem is in the solenoids or the electrical circuitry supplying their power. After we have performed all of these quick checks on the system, suppose we've discovered no obvious problem. Well, then we're going to have to go further. We're going to have to list the probable causes that still remain. An obstruction in a valve port, or a hidden mechanical problem in the cylinder. We're going to have to test them by breaking some lines to check the system flow more closely, or by replacing components. But the point is that by looking for an obvious cause first, we've probably saved ourselves a lot of needless time and trouble. In almost all cases, we would already have discovered the trouble. Remember, always start with the procedures that take the least time and effort. In later lessons, we're going to troubleshoot more complicated systems, which will require more detailed inspection and analysis. But the principles we've looked at here on our simple system will remain the same. We will always begin by gathering information and analyzing the situation. We'll use our knowledge of the system and a careful inspection of the machine to look for an obvious cause of the trouble. And whether we are visually inspecting the machine or actually breaking some lines to test a probable cause, will always proceed logically, using a process of elimination to narrow down the possibilities. In our next lesson, we'll begin examining the causes of hydraulic failure and see how to minimize the problems that can occur in a system. For now, read the material in lesson one of your study guide. Do the practice exercises, and when you